Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 27th of February, and this is Govind Raj Ethi Raj broadcasting from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day: the markets search for signals and direction. What will they be? Oil prices down again as oil markets too search for direction. Two companies, both over 75 years old, prepare for a fresh battle in paints. India's chip plans and why Nvidia chips are special. How Indian businesses have thousands of crores of unspent money for social projects. This is a core report with Govind Raj Ethiraj. Indian indices are down. Stock markets moved down in the absence of any clear signals, which, by the way, is likely to be the situation for some time. There are, of course, multiple other signals that markets are watching, including in the United States. But the multiplicity of them makes the whole index gazing business equivalent to stargazing. Meanwhile, the BSE Sensex closed 353 points lower at 72,790, while the Nifty 50 closed down at 22,122. That was down 91 points. One stock which had a tough day was Asian Paints, and we will come to that in a moment in our companies news section, which sometimes is also the stock of the day. I refer to the multiplicity of signals. Bloomberg reported that U.S. equity futures signaled a pause for stocks around their record highs world over as investors geared up for a busy week of data, including the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation. With earnings season now having mostly ended, third quarter for India, fourth quarter for the United States, investors were likely to focus more on economic data, which in the U.S. is the core personal consumption expenditures price index, an indicator closely watched by the Fed. India, of course, had its own consumer consumption expenditure price index, though not called exactly that, which was released on Saturday after a gap of almost 13 years. Fourth quarter U.S. GDP numbers are due on Wednesday, and back home, a Reuters poll has said that India's economic growth may have moderated to 6.6 percent year on year in the October to December quarter, thanks to robust government spending, which was high, has now slowed down, and growth in the agriculture sector has remained muted. Oil falls again now near eighty-one dollars. Every dollar that oil prices lose are good news for countries like India, since India is more of a consuming country rather than an oil-producing country like others. Brent fell towards eighty-one dollars a barrel. Oil has now traded in a narrow band of about three dollars a barrel for the past two weeks. The cartel, which is the OPEC or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, and their allies, including Russia, are widely expected to prolong their current cutbacks into the next quarter at their meeting early next month. said bloomberg so this move to manage production has not made any real difference to prices at least so far thanks more likely to demand the battle of the paint giant begins and here is our company's new section it is not often that the arrival of a newcomer shakes up the market and markets except of course it depends on how you define a newcomer The Aditya Birla Group launched its paint brand Birla Opus Paints with about 10,000 crores of investment, spreading into six manufacturing plants, a wide range of paints, and a 10,000 crore revenue target in three years. By any stretch for this product and market, this is ambitious. And the Birlas have been scaling up the size of this project even between the first announcement of it a few years ago and the launch last week. But Grasim, the company which launched the paints business, was set up as a textile company in 1947, the year of India's independence. It started more specifically as a linen and wool making company then, and most of those businesses continue till today, particularly linen. Rival Asian Paints, who we will come to, was set up in 1942, just five years before. The difference, of course, is that Asian Paints has always been a paints company. So this is an interesting story of core competence versus a diversified company or conglomerate. But the round one has already begun in the stock markets. Credit Lyonnais, the brokerage or CLSA, has already downgraded Asian Paints, which has a 53% of the overall paints market, by the way. And the stock price fell further yesterday to a 10-month low. Not all brokerages have followed suit. Goldman Sachs has held its neutral rating, though its price target and its earnings per share estimates have come down on the ground that Billa's paint strategy was way more comprehensive than they had earlier assumed, according to Money Control. Macquarie has maintained its outperform on Asian Paints, and the other players like Berger, which has 19%, and Kansai Nerolac, which has 12%, could be affected more, particularly Berger Paints, according to the stock brokerage. Now, in general, a non-venture funded big bank greenfield entry like this into a mature marketplace is not very common. And in this, and interestingly enough, as I said, from two companies who've been around for more than 75 years, 
one of course in paints and one in all kinds of other businesses. Now, there are similar examples of such late stage entry from the recent past, including Reliance and Geo entering and then re-entering telecom and onwards into media and entertainment. There are, of course, other examples, but not that many. All of this makes it an interesting space to watch, not so much for what happens to the paint industry, I'm sure good things, but more to see how mature businesses like the Birlas perform in new segments with the heft and clout of their legacy brand, including in construction materials like cement in this case, and also how older companies launch into newer areas in itself a sign of India's consumer market potential and who can potentially reap the benefits of it, hint, not just venture-funded companies. I do not talk about conglomerates like Tata's who are constantly investing in new businesses because they're fundamentally new and not necessarily always coming back into older businesses, like in this case being paints. And of course, these are consumer facing products. And I'm talking about paints again, which call for a fair degree of consumer connect and soft pull, something Asian paints has defined and understood quite well in this segment. Of course, driving all of this is the booming real estate sector in the country, which consumes some 70% of the paint produced in the country, according to some reports. The real estate sector itself has seen late stage entries from older business houses like the Mahindras and Godridge and more recently Raymond and even more recently Birla, the same people who've launched the Opus Paints. Now you can join the dots. India gets going on chips and then why are AI chips so special? After the initial hiccups of multi-billion dollar chip projects faltering at start, Bloomberg is now reporting that the government of India is looking at a fresh set of $21 billion of semiconductor manufacturing proposals. Israel's Tower Semiconductor is proposing a $9 billion plant, while India's Tata Group has put forward a $8 billion chip fabrication unit, according to Bloomberg. Now, the offer is that the government would bear half the cost of any approved project with an initial budget of $10 billion for the task. A joint venture between mining giant Vedanta Resources and Taiwan's Foxconn technology fell apart after they could not find a partner for chip design technology, which is where the biggest challenge would be. U.S. memory maker Micron Technology is setting up a $2.75 billion assembly and testing facility in Gujarat in the town of Tholera, being developed as a possible and prospective chip-making hub, according to Bloomberg once again. The Tatas, just to return to them, is expected to partner with Taiwan's Power Chip Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation for its project, though it's also spoken or held talks with United Microelectronics. Both Tata and Tower's facilities would produce the so-called mature chips using 40 nanometer or essentially older technology that are widely used in consumer electronics, automobiles, defense systems and aircrafts and not necessarily, let's say, something like the iPhone 15. Bloomberg says that Japan's Renesis Electronics Corporation is also looking to forge a venture with Murugappa Group's CG Power and Industrial Solutions arm for a chip-making facility. Now, speaking about chips and cutting edge chips, the world's attention is obviously on NVIDIA, whose stock has been shooting like a rocket with the market value around $2 trillion right now. NVIDIA is a leader in graphics chips, which are built with hundreds of processing cores that perform multiple simultaneous threads of computation, modeling complex physics like shadows and reflections. Bloomberg says that NVIDIA's engineers realized in the early 2000s that they could retool graphics accelerators for other applications by dividing tasks up into smaller lumps and then working on them at the same time. Just over a decade ago, AI researchers discovered that their work could finally be made practical by using this kind of chip. Now, NVIDIA controls about 80% of the market for accelerators in the AI data centers operated by Amazon Inc.'s AWS, Alphabet Inc.'s Google Cloud, and Microsoft's Azure. Not that these companies have not tried to build their own chips. They have, as have advanced micro devices, that's AMD and Intel, but it's not matched up to NVIDIA as yet. Now, speaking about NVIDIA, I caught up with Sunil Nanda, who started up the India Design Center for NVIDIA in Bangalore in 2004 or 20 years ago and ran it for around five years. The center today employs over 3,000 people, mostly engineers. Nanda has six technical patents and is a recognized industry expert in computer architecture and VLSI design and earlier founded a company that was acquired by Intel Corporation in the United States. He now runs a social incubator out of Pilani in Rajasthan. And I began by asking him quite simply, why NVIDIA chips, to whose designs he too has contributed over the years, are so different? At the root of it, the difference is between sequential processing and parallel processing. So the general purpose CPUs, like the ones that Intel does and you know others do, they are sequential engines. What that means is they do one task, they move on to the next task, they move on to the next task, task and so on. Whereas Parallel processing 
is just like it says, you're trying to do many, many things in parallel. So that in a nutshell is what it is. So NVIDIA or other graphics people have figured out how to do these you know, thousands of cores on a chip, each core being simple, because there are other attendant technical difficulties doing that, but that has been figured out. Very different from sequential processing. Now let's move to AI. In AI, your central problem is again, believe it or not, matrix manipulation. But simplified, even more than it is in graphics. Simplified in the sense the precision required for the arithmetic is not as severe as the precision required for graphics. Simplifies the course further. Simplifies the course further means you can design it using less number of transistors. Design it with less, less number of transistors means smaller area. That means you can put more of them on a chip. Okay, so these are the essential differences between a general purpose computer, graphics, AI engine, and so on. Right? Because in AI, the fundamental problem is you have to train the sucker on gazillion bits of data. Now, this can take many, 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 many boards of many, many chips all running together. Imagine the power consumption. So to be able to simplify each core to its basics and reduce its power consumption is what makes these things a winner. So why has, in a very broad sense, of course, or why or how has NVIDIA managed to do this while others have not been able to do it, at least so far, and connecting it to the kind of frenzy we've seen in uh, AI demand, demand for NVIDIA chips, and so on? So there's, there are technical and non-technical reasons. So let's come to the non-technical reasons. Begin. So I don't know if you have uh, read this uh, book called The Innovator's Dilemma by Mark Christensen. He puts it very well. If you want to innovate, you got to put your best people on the job. In most companies, what happens is the best people are busy solving current problems because that's next quarter's revenue. The second tier people get assigned to these innovative ideas. So it takes leadership. And leadership is where Jensen comes in in my way. I have a lot of admiration for, for Jensen. So, you know, he can turn the company on a dime. And for a company as large as NVIDIA to be able to do that, the leadership quality is tremendous. And the risk-taking ability. That was the non-technical part, which is, of course, critical because that's the leadership. And what about the technical part? So on the technical part, what ends up happening is, you see, what's the name of the game in chips? To make money, your chips have to yield. Okay, now let me explain that uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, I won't get too technical. So every wafer, see, when you go to TSMC, you buy wafers. N number of wafers I'm going to buy. This is the cost. TSMC will say per wafer, I'm going to charge you this much. I don't care what you put on the wafer, but each wafer is going to charge you this much. Now, all these wafers have defects, random defects. That's just the nature of the game. So let's say you have, let's say you have 10 defects per wafer and you have designed a chip where only 10 of them will fit on a wafer. What is the yield you want to get? Because there's a chance of a defect in every chip, right? Now you reduce the size and let's say 100 of these chips fit on a wafer. Now you have 90% yield because only 10 of them will die. So that's the economics. Now it goes further than that. Now, when you have these thousands of cores, your chances of particular core not working on a chip significantly I mean, is there. Now, can you recover from it? Do you have the design capability and the organizational capability to be able to detect which core is not working and somehow cut it out of the circuit and still sell the chip with 990 cores instead of the thousand cores that it is supposed to have? Now, that is technically very challenging. Typically in all these chips like Intel and all that, what happens is there's a defect, the chip doesn't work, you throw it, finished, gone. Whereas in this case, what you do is you find out which core is not working and then have specialized mechanisms for turning that core off and still selling the chip. Okay, so these are some of the technical challenges. 
when we talk about the whole AI boom or the AI frenzy that we are seeing today, it seems to you know converge upon two or three things. I mean, one of course is is the chip itself, and the second is let's say the demand for it, which is really the let's say the whole AI demand or the AI boom that we are seeing. I mean, Chat GPT and so on and so forth. NVIDIA launched something called the H100 data center chip, and which alone apparently has added more than a trillion dollars of to its value. Now, if you were to take that one chip as a, an example, what would you say is, let's say, is the next thing if, if there was, if one could think like that? Uh, as, I mean, what's the next graphics processor or what's the next thing which either could come from a competitor or from NVIDIA itself? These architectures in my mind are still in the infancy. There is a lot more innovation that will happen. So that's architecturally, you know, it may move into a totally different arena altogether. Somebody will discover, hey, here's a better way of doing it than matrix multiplication. And you know, so let's use tensors, so yeah, whatever, right? But to be on a treadmill, these chips will continue to reduce their power consumption which is the key in data centers. So today, if you can deploy 5,000 of them, tomorrow you should be able to deploy 50,000. Today, you can't do the 50,000 because you don't have that much power. I mean, power is not just what the chip consumes. That, of course, is significant power. Imagine the power required to cool the premises because there's so much heat being generated, AC, so on and so forth. So power consumption is the killer feature in all these and that will continue to improve as technology improves. So, you know, that's what I'm going to predict. The next one, lower power consumption. Next one, even lower. And then from the side, someone will come with a whole new architecture and <laughs> disrupt the whole scene. So the disruptive innovation will happen. Okay, it's still it's in its infancy. And, you know, people are still discovering real uses for all this uh, chat GPT. I mean, I get pretty disgusted when I read about Oh, here is a toothpaste designed with AI. And, you know, here is a <laughs> eyeglasses. Come on, you know, give me a break. That's that's not what it's about. So, you know, let real uses be found, uh, real productive uses be found. Right now, it's still a play. Though. So you worked with Jensen Huang. And uh, what's the one thing or one of the things perhaps that people don't know about him, which you appreciated or liked? He loves his wine. <laughs> <laughs> Great sense of humor, merciless, totally take no prisoners kind of guy. You know, driven, dedicated, and you know he has the ability to nurture and lead, to have people believe in what he says. That's because he does have a vision, and he's not afraid to take chances. That is Jensen for you. Right. Sunil, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. The importance of Corporate India's unspent CSR fund. Indian company laws mandate that companies should spend 2% of the average net profits made during the preceding three years on corporate social responsibility projects, which are of course defined as is the eligibility in terms of size and turnover. Broadly, according to Hurun India report, around 300 companies spent about 12,900 crores on CSR last year versus the prescribed limit of about 13,420 crores. The interesting point or the number to focus on here is the unspent CSR money, which was over 1,000 crore rupees. Now, the law says that you can give that unspent money to the PM Care Fund or other prescribed funds by the government, that is. The argument here, however, is that companies could be more active and proactive in the way they manage their funds and thus play a more active role in adding heft to their social contributions. Also because of time, the total CSR pool has now crossed over 100,000 crores and will keep increasing as, let's say, profits grow in Nifty 50 or Sensex 30 companies and, of course, others including unlisted companies. I spoke with Govind Ayer, a board member at Infosys and also chairman of Social Venture Partners India, an organization that works with organizations to create structured engagement with non-profits, among others, across India. And I began by asking him, to talk about why unspent CSR funds were such an important issue. So let me pull back for a minute, go and say that I think the CSR initiative launched many years ago, I think has been a fantastic addition to India's social sector development and the entire development of the country. And I think it's going really well. I think 
from what I read from reports, over 25,000 crores was deployed in the last year, year and a half, in the last couple of years towards this. But what's more important is that it should be deployed to the right causes. And I think many CSR companies are doing that really well through their own foundations, through implement agencies, etc. However, our observation is that there are times when they're not able to find the right avenues to invest behind. They're not able to find the right grantees. They're not able to find the independent partners. And uh, statistics show us that about 10 to 30% of CSR funds sometimes don't get spent in a year. And as per law, they need to deploy it in, within a certain time frame. So it's an issue because India's development suffers, very simplistically put. And these are large numbers, 1,000 to 2,000 crores a year if they don't get spent. It's a large amount of money that can help people in different strata, whether it's economic development, social development, infrastructure development. So I think it's important to help. Um, I don't think it's a it's an issue that's um, making it a, a major issue, but I think it's a huge opportunity for a multiplier impact. And the last point I would say is that when I've spoken to people who have not been able to deploy their CSR monies, it's largely because they've not found the right causes. They've not found the right implement agencies. And this is something we should resolve. I don't think this should become a burning issue anymore. We should find ways in which everybody has the opportunities to invest. They, choose, they can choose not to for other reasons, but not because of lack of availability of options. Those who are investing today, so I'm assuming, let's say over the last decade or so, more than 100,000 crores could have gone into this, going by this number. And that's a large number. And as we were speaking earlier, the compounding is quite high, whether you look forward or backward. So where are the funds going now as, as the ones at least that are being channeled towards uh, different causes and so on? So, so there, are, there, are, there are quite a few sectors that there's investment going behind, but you know, sectors like education, healthcare, women's empowerment, women's development, as well as in the area of uh, mental health. These are areas that are starting to pick up uh, and, and going after. I'd say disproportional spend is definitely towards education and creating jobs, and which is required for the country. So I think the, the way our CSR is being spent today is very strategic, is very focused um, at the right causes, at the right core of what's required of uh, the growth for the country. So I would Pick maybe five areas that a disproportionate spend or 80% spend goes to, which is education, livelihood, healthcare, now increasingly sustainability, environment, and mental health. What would you tell a company who says that, yes, I am making profits as per the computation uh, that the government has set out. I really don't have the time and the bandwidth to you know sit down and find a cause and then monitor it and so on. I'd rather just give it to a PM Cares fund which also I'm allowed to do in order to get my tax exemptions. So I think it's definitely a good idea to do that. It allows you to make a contribution to a fund that's actually intended to make a difference to the country by implementing through the government agencies. And nothing wrong in doing that. But I would say the most important part about philanthropy is engagement. People engage with the money they give. When you give it to PM Cares, it is being done for the right reasons and with the right deployment plan. But engaging with your own money that you have created and generated over the years is the best way to do philanthropy. Now, why do people not do it? For two reasons. One is they may not have the resources to do it. The second is they may not know how to do it. And that's where organizations, many organizations in India, like Social Venture Partners that I'm part of, or Dasra, or Giving Pie, or Accelerating in Philanthropy, there are many companies today in India that provide you the opportunity to understand where to go and how to do it. And then you can make your choices. Today, people don't have the choices and we'd love to provide them choices as we go along. You sit on several boards, Govin. What's your sense about, is this, are these things discussed in board meetings? What's the level of engagement that there is? So from the many boards that I've worked with over my journey at Econ Zender, I've had the opportunity to work with at least 20, 35 companies and their board levels. I do feel this is a topic that's very serious. The chairs on the CSR committee and the ESG committees are taking this seriously as to where it's going and how it's going and the impact thereof. So yes, there is a very, very conscious choice in boardrooms, at least over the last five years. And I think what they're asking for, the boards are really focused on how can we make a bigger impact? How can we view this as not just needing to spend the money, but really wanting to spend the money to have impact? And I think impact studies are starting to show that the money we put in the right ways can actually make a change in social economic development, can change in the way people perceive how, you know, their money can actually make a difference to economic development in the country. And I think that's very critical. If India is going to be a fight to an economy in the distant future, it's very important for us to build a strong, robust social infrastructure to support that growth. 
Because economic capitalistic growth is not the only way India can grow. India needs a strong social fabric to really build and hold that growth. And I think that's where CSR comes and that's where corporations come in. Right. And this, of course, the pool that we're talking about is both listed and unlisted. And just a sense as you look ahead, Govind, so, uh, you know, if people say nifty earnings growth is, let's say, 15%, obviously, all of that means that this capital will keep expanding and quite dramatically in that compounding way that we spoke of. So what should companies be doing in order to gear for all the cash that at least all projections say that they're going to create? So the first thing is, I think institutions should start looking at CSR as a strategic initiative and not a Cost initiative. I've got to use it, so let me find the projects. I remember one one board member telling me he walked up to the chair of the board and said, "You know, I want to invest behind getting a consulting firm to help me deploy five thousand crores over the next five years." So that person said, "You're a board member. What are you talking about?" So he said, "No, I think CSR is good, and our company is going to deploy five thousand crores. Let's get somebody to come in and tell us how we can over the next ten years make an institutional impact." Now that's the kind of thinking I would like. Uh, go. I'd like people to start thinking about social impact as not being a derivative of the corporate world that we work in, but actually a strategic initiative as something that you're committed to doing, like you are very much with customers, with clients, with products. Make this also social. Building the social fabric should be a strategic option for uh, for a corporation and not anything else. How would you suggest or uh, think that people like me, let's say I'm a journalist, how should we be looking at these investments? Or maybe let's say someone who is trying to understand a company's performance. I mean, company's performance today is obviously linked to balance sheet. This could be a triple bottom line or whatever you want. You could call it in many words. But how do people outside of the system assess what a company is doing with the kind of numbers that you're talking about now? So I think, great question, uh, Govind. I think two things. One is I think we should view this as social profit. We are used to capitalistic profit. So triple bottom line is part of that. So I'm a believer that while we say NGOs are non-government organizations, I think calling them social profit organizations is, or social purpose organizations is a much better way of giving credibility and institutional uh, purpose to this category. The second thing is I think we, people like you and me and others, should engage with our money. We all have the ability to contribute, both financially and non-financially. Just to be clear, this is all about, I mean, I love CSR organizations that may give 100 crores but get 100,000 employees or 1,000 employees from their company working with that 100 crores. To me, that is engaged philanthropy. How can we get CSR and employees to go together to make the social, the world a better place? And I would say, Govin, that organizations are there, the organizations like Social Venture Partners, where we have about 600 of us across India today focusing with working with about 130 non-for-profits and helping them scale and grow over a consistent three-year time frame. We help work with them for three years. Those are organizations that people like you and others can either be part of, but more importantly, work with to drive your agenda. So you might have a need to, in, you know, as a journalist organization, you may choose to say, I want to do something in arts and culture. I want to do something in the area of a medium that's humanities. We'll find you the right opportunities for you to go out. There are many such organizations like SVP, at least 10 that I work with closely to help me understand the sector and to help me engage with the sector. So my parting comment is engage with your money. Don't give your money. Because engagement is what drives impact for the soul. Uh, giving is a wallet decision, but engagement is uh, more important. Right. Wonderful note to end on. Govin, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. That was The Core Report with me, Govind Raj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening. <laughs>